Uh, good morning, um, uh, shipmates, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my pleasure to see so many of you up so early in the morning. Oh, those are the people who caught the first boat. <laughs> but uh, we do have this um, opportunity today to go out and see the great uh, Laguna San Rafael, the glacier that is um, not, not near but not far. The ship cannot go close to it anymore because the, the depth of the water and also the danger of the calving of the glacier. So, as you know, we have an, the catamaran boat that is taking us there to visit it in, in waves and then we'll get almost close enough to feel the the ice, but not, uh, not too dangerously. So we've already spent uh, now two days going through the great uh, Chilean fjord land here, and I'm going to give you just a survey of some of the origins of this tremendous land and then some of the life that lives in it. Uh, I'm neither a, ge a geologist nor a, wild a wildlife myself, but I will show you just some of the basic things that some of us have already seen. And of course, this is a, a, a unique landscape that is comparable to the other fjord lands of the world, of course, Scandinavia, Norway, then Alaska, uh, New Zealand, and so each of these areas has a very similar geological quality to them, though especially in the flora and the fauna, they, they have quite different life forms that have evolved in this area. So we, we are in this um, arm of the sea in a fjord, which is a flooded valley, essentially, and all of these great waterways in here um, used to be dry land, and then they were covered with ice, and now they've been flooded by the sea, and that's what makes this dramatic scenery. South America, as uh, one of the great continents, it used to be all squished together in Pangaea and these other um, uh, conglomerations that have been shown through geological history, separated from Antarctica. They used to be one continent, and of course, South America used to be attached to Africa. And uh, you can see this in the rocks, the geological traces of the movement of the planets and the tectonics. Uh, in this area where we are right now, the, um, <clears throat> the Peruvian and Chilean trench is the, the deep subduction diving of the Pacific Plate and the Nazca and uh, Coco Plates that are called on the bottom of the Pacific Ocean are pushing underneath the continent of South America, and that is why the Andes is that great mountain range which is still rising to this day. But this is probably the most dramatic uh, difference between sea depth and mountain ranges anywhere in the world. So if you, see the, if you can see the numbers on the trench, the deepest place measured so far is over 8,000 meters. And then within a few hundred uh, kilometers there are mountains that are 7,000 meters high. So you combine that to get about a 15,000 meter uh, range of of uh, elevation between the deep sea and the high mountains. And this is still a moving uh, puzzle because uh, the plate is pushing on South America, still rising the Andean mountains, which are, which are going up at about um, uh, 50 millimeters a year. And this is, of course, uh, impacting uh, the uh, altitudes of this great uh, continent. Uh, in very early geological time, the Amazon River used to run in the Pacific, but because the Andes have risen, the Amazon ended up becoming a bigger stream going to, of course, the Atlantic. Santiago, Arequipa, these other, and even Easter Island are still moving to the east. And so this is a, creates a you know, slow geological motion, but it's very measurable even uh, as we are here because we're in a very active uh, geological area. Now, as we've seen by our trip, we've come down through the different islands that then uh, have channels through, and we've been in the uh, Moraleda Channel, then we went around in the um, uh, Ison uh, Fjord up to um, Puerto uh, Cachabuco. Then we, some of us yesterday went on that long ride all the way over the Cordillera to the Central Valley, which is quite different and quite dramatic. But that creates a great variety of uh, climates and wildlife in the very climate-specific regions of the Fjordland. Uh, here's just a satellite view to show you the waters come in so far and so close to the, the mountains that this uh, makes it the dramatic place that it is. Now, you've, we've already seen a lot of this, uh, just in, we'll have a couple more days in the Great Fjordland, but um, they're characterized by these deep valleys where the depth of the water is often comparable to the slope of the mountains right next to them, but then the rivers come running off and then create these great mud fields, often with the uh, glacial sediment or moraine deposits will end up creating deltas like you see this in the Kamau Fjord. 
Uh, this uh, is what gives it its great area. And in the, 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 the lowlands, there have been very uh, tremendous primeval forests, which are now mostly cut. Now some are preserved, much of its regrowth, so that uh, this, um, this land is um, in some ways a great wilderness, but on the other hand, has already had considerable impact by human activity, both the indigenous people, but especially, of course, in the last couple of centuries of settlement by uh, the other parts of the world. Now, the, the most dramatic part of the entire fjordland is the Torres del Paine, which is down near Puerto Natales, uh, on the way down to uh, Punta Arenas. Now, we will not be able to go by ship close to this. Uh, it's quite f far inland, but it has the dramatic um, towers of Paine. Paine is not actually a name um, from <clears throat> English uh, as a surname. People think it's uh, named after somebody, but, uh, but actually means blue in the native uh, Tehualche Indian language because it has uh, dramatic rises, the towers, and then a lot of glaciers that come off all sides uh, in the Argentina and in the Chilean side. But this uh, particular mountain range is um, uh, unique in the fjords. Most are uh, granite, basalt, igneous uh, rock, and with some metamorphic and few uplifted sedimentary rocks. But in Torres de Paine, they have a, a basalt with a cap of magma that froze on top of the, um, the harder rock uh, in an eruption hundreds of millions of years ago. And then that capped off the mountain such that the, the softer rock eroded below but left the, t the tops of it in the black... Uh, magma rock on top. So this creates um, tremendous um, towers and this most dramatic of all the mountains in the fjordland. Uh, this, as you can see, has the, the basalt that's been lifted up and it's, it's slowly eroding, but it creates this great uh, uh, towering effect. There are over 15 peaks, over 2,000 meters there. Now we also saw an example of this just yesterday up the Rio Simpson with this um, piece of rock that is, again, uh, it's actually a basalt but uh, it was left over by a division of a glacier that had, uh, the ice had carved the whole U-shaped valley but left this, what they call the English cake. The cake uh, those of us who went up there yesterday actually had a little uh, meal overlooking this, and you remember it had the face of the old man in the mountain, uh, which uh, they likened to a carving from Easter Island, Rapa Nui, uh, you know, the great stone heads that they carved up there. Well, this is a natural one, and uh, looks like he does need a haircut, though. And we went up over the valley and very dramatically went up through the canyons that the Rio Simpson had uh, cut, the remnant of, again, it was all ice before, and then we went over to uh, Kohaike, which is the capital of this particular region, and then suddenly the, the land is drier, and the mountains are sort of uh, mesa sedimentary rock. There was some shale, uh, some limestone, and so the geology of this area is, um, changes dramatically as you go over the Cordillera toward Argentina. Now, so somebody asked me yesterday, Patagonia, is this whole area called Patagonia? Uh, traditionally, that was what was called the Argentine Pampas side, and the name came from when Magellan met some of the natives who were very much bigger than the Europeans, and he called them the Big Feet. And that name got applied to all of southern Ar uh, Argentina and now also to the whole Chilean side. So this whole southern tip of South America is called Patagonia, but uh, climatically and culturally and all the um, flora and fauna are quite different on either side because the pampas of Argentina are much of it's almost a desert. And, but the Chilean side is this great fjordland. But in the middle, in these high valleys, you get sort of the mixed uh, quality of both of them. It's still mountainous, but it is quite uh, uh, dry compared to the coastline. So this whole area from where we left in Puerto Montt all the way down to Tierra del Fuego and all that used to be under ice and by glacial remains uh, can be measured in the, in the moraine patterns where the ice was. Uh, this, this, when it receded, the land then had all the valleys filled in by the rising seas uh, and that's why it is so variegated. This is a, a remarkable uh, place to navigate. Of course, we've come down all the way. This is uh, Cachabuco. Then we come down today down to this lagoon where there is a lake above it, but the glacier's hanging on the tidal waters. And then we have to go all the way out the um, Estero and then out this channel, the 
Paluccia Channel, then we'll come down to the, the Gulf of Penas, which is a, Pena means pain, because you go out and in the calm, out of the calm fjords, and then you end up in rolling in the ocean. So later tonight, you'll, you'll note um, that we'll begin to get the Pacific swells again before we slip in and go back into the southern uh, fjord land, and then we are in sheltered waters all the way down into the Straits of Magellan to get to Punta Arenas. Now, this whole area is mostly unpopulated, but it does have its wildlife uh, much variegated because a lot of these islands are, are, are quite far away from each other, and there have never been many migratory uh, species between some of them. Um, for instance, in Alaska, you get deer swimming from islands to islands, and most of the populations on, in this part of Chile are, are sort of island-specific and have some local variations. But back in the Ice Age, as we all remember, uh, if you were there, the whole area was covered with ice. Back in the, the Greater Ice Age, about 15,000 years ago, um, about a third of the planet was covered with glaciers. Now we have less than 10%, mostly in, of course, Antarctica, Greenland. But the, uh, the third largest ice fields in the world are in Patagonia on the Cordillera between Chile and Argentina. And so this whole ice covered the entire area and then receded and left these great ice fields. This is the northern one, where, which is just north of, um, uh, or rather just south of the glacier that is where we are today at um, uh, San Rafael. The larger one is the southern field. It is about four times larger than the northern one. The northern one is about 50 by 100 kilometers. The southern one is 100 by 350 kilometers. So it's a very vast area, and uh, it still gets snow, and then it still feeds all of the glaciers that are dropping off into the ocean. Uh, it is getting warmer, and it is all receding, though. So it, as it comes down the, the tops of the mountains, they break off into these floating uh, flatbergs, and we'll see them today as we go out into the, into the laguna, uh, and then they will melt quickly in the ocean. The, the lower sea level altitudes are never frozen, unlike, um, let's say, the Arctic and parts of Alaska. There's no ice sheet that develops in the fjords because of the, the nature of the Pacific Ocean is fair, moderates the temperature on the coast, even though it is... Uh, of course, frozen up in the high mountains. So as these uh, mountain fields come down, they come down to the face of a glacier, and then it breaks off and the f ice feeds into the ocean. But all of this has been receding ever since the first uh, Europeans came and measured the uh, extents of it. Um, the native people remember orally that there was much more back thousands of years ago, and they have lived moving in the forests and valleys knowing that the, w the world is getting warmer and watching the flora and fauna react to it. And of course, nowadays we see it all the more dramatically because you have these uh, ice fields and their attendant glaciers are all stepping back as is measured in this uh, version of uh, uh, the glacier Uppsala. Now that is the last measure here was 1995. It is well off this map right now. And uh, most of them are receding to the point where it is a great worry among climatologists that these, um, the, the ice fields of, of South America feed many rivers and feed many um, life forms, and, but uh, it's ex expected that within another hundred years there may be no more ice field here. And of course the greater concern is if it happens here and also in Greenland and Antarctica, the seas will rise, we don't know how much, some predictions have said it could be um, two, three meters or ten or fifteen meters, which of course would have worldwide impact. Now. <clears throat> Here's a couple of the volcanoes that sit in the ice, giving a particularly a dramatic uh, sense, the, sort of like in Iceland where you have uh, volcanoes erupting out of uh, great ice fields. And so here's the Cerros uh, Arenales, and then the, the uh, Torres de Pin again, which is sort of its, uh, its own uh, um, pile of great mountains and, and glaciers. Uh, here's the gray glacier that's coming down uh, off the southern field, one of the larger ones. Um, then there's the Bruggen and the Grieve, and the, there's many. There's uh, about 30 different major ice uh, uh, glaciers in this whole stretch of the fjordland. And again, the Bruggen here has been retreating dramatically. Now it's back up uh, even off this map. But uh, that is just the nature of the world here. 
And we are here to see it. As we come out today and go up to San Rafael, you'll go on the boat and go right up to the face of this and uh, see the great deep blue ice and the um, radiance of this um, phenomena. I mean, I imagine many of you have been to other parts of the world seen the glaciers in other ways, or maybe you have one in your backyard, like I do in upstate New York today. But uh, this is an example of the ice when it gets compressed with uh, the weight of the snow and it it forms an, uh, eventually a, a form of ice that has no uh, air in it. It's pressed down, and then that means it's uh, glacial ice is actually heavier than what you'll get in your um, surface ice uh, or sea ice. But uh, uh, what it does is, it, because there's no air in it and it is denser, it um, does not um, uh, refract out as white. It comes out as uh, blue, because the blue is reflected off of the uh, nature of the compacted ice. And that's why uh, when, if you, if you dare in another place, you can go hiking through some of the ice caves. When a stream in the summertime washes underneath the, uh, the glacier, then it creates these tunnels that you can go hiking through and, and be uh, in the great blue uh, realm of the uh, glacier underneath it if you dare. Now, we will more likely see this kind of a front end of the edges where the powdered uh, stone is turned into what they call glacial dust, which is very, very fine, creates beaches and kind of gray um, wash into the water. You'll see this today. And uh, particularly as the um, glaciers recede, they leave these kind of muddy deposits and uh, it gets real dirty ice that way. Uh, other times they make a kind of a dam of, of the moraine rock will be built up but then if that breaks because of heavy rain or just the natural melting of it, suddenly the lake that is behind the ice will then drain out. This is a lake which a couple of years ago um, just disappeared. It, it, uh, it finally broke its moraine and it melted enough so that the, all the water just um, ran out and left the big mud flats up higher in the, um, near the ice fields. All of this water comes cascading off the dramatically high mountains into uh, the lowlands, as we can see when we went up to yesterday. Here's a, here's a cascade that's off of what's called a hanging valley. This used to be a big block of ice that was sitting there and the, in the water, and then as it receded, it, ha it reveals where the ice had carved out a sort of an amphitheater in the rock. And the, the glacier we'll see today is predicted to do the same thing. It is now what's called a tidal glacier. It is sitting on the uh, water, but as it recedes back, it will then pick up and then eventually be gone like this one is. But it leaves uh, still running water and the, the beauties of the fjords. We'll see some as we go sailing out in the next day or two. This kind of water, though, as it came, comes down off of the ice fields, then creates a lot of humidity and then is very um, um, nurturing to all of the uh, the trees and the, the, the great variety of, of plant life that is in the lowlands. Now this is a temperate rainforest, very similar to what you have in Alaska, and it has a, um, a very rapid growing season when there's enough light, but in the winter it does not freeze, and so you have a lot of um, um, sort of temperate evergreens, and but you don't get that kind of uh, beaten feeling like you get in the plant life in some northern and high mountain areas where they only have the summer and then they have to retreat, drop their leaves and to survive. But uh, they have other hazards. This was something we saw the other day, which is landslides. This whole area, because it is on the, um, the great uh, Andean fault lines, it has a lot of volcanoes and a lot of earthquakes. The most recent one was a couple of years ago in Concepcion, north of Puerto Montt, an 8.8 earthquake, which was felt down here and caused a number of landslides, and uh, they had a 12-meter tsunami from one of these landslides that came up right where we were um, yesterday and broke all of the si salmon pens and let, let go all the salmon also. But uh, this is something that, that shows you how current and recent all of this activity is. There's also quite a bit of volcanoes. Now, these are just some of the major ones that are known to be active all the way down uh, but um, they leave often um, these conical spikes that get eroded. Uh, some of them are more perfect, like we saw a volcano Osorno yesterday, uh, a couple of days ago up on the lakes from Puerto Montt. Others are broken and eroded like this. Um, this is the most recent big one. You might have, might have uh, heard about it when it happened a couple of years ago, the uh, Kaiten volcano, which is uh, uh, north of here. 
Uh, that was considered to be inactive and extinct, but then one day it decided not to be, and uh, they had to evacuate. You see the town on the right under it uh, on the shore there. Um, only a few people died in it, but it, but it threatened to cover the entire town sort of like Pompeii. But instead, the winds were such that it blew it over, all the ash over to uh, Argentina instead. Uh, this is a, a regular phenomena in the fjordlands. Even though most of the mountains were built or, or risen um, so many hundreds of millions of years ago, there's still a few places where the tectonic activity is bringing up new lava and new eruptions. Uh, most dramatically up in the ice fields. Here's uh, Cerro Hudson, which is uh, a, a real steamy, hot, lava center to an icy wasteland up there and very dangerous to go up and hike up there. Uh, only, only volcanologists are allowed near these places. And then as you go down the, the, the mountains again, you have uh, uh, the hardiest of the plants can survive on the ledges up high and they are creeping up the elevation as it gets warmer around here. But most of the great forest is of course down low and in these great sweeping valleys and plains which uh, have plenty of water and again they don't freeze. So you have an, uh, developed over the hundreds of millions of years certain plant forms which are unique to this area. Uh, this is the most famous of the trees here, the uh, Aleris andino, which is sort of a redwood tree and it, um, it grows to tremendous uh, 40 meter size, very uh, four or five meters trunk uh, some of them are over 2,000 years old. The, most of the preserves of them are north of here. Uh, and they have uh, protected them from what was very rapacious logging uh, going on for many centuries. And most recently, in 1950s, there was a series of great fires through much of the, the land that had been begin to be cleared for farming. Just yesterday, again, in the Rio Simpson, you saw all the stumps in the fields and pastures that are the remnants of the Alers forest that used to be there, but it was chopped and then burnt and then the fire spread right up the mountains and destroyed uh, vast areas of, of, of Patagonia. Uh, said that um, an area the size of Belgium burned within about three to four years, mostly because of human settling coming in, chopping wood, burning off fields, and then it got out of control and it was a very dry spell that just spread the fire out and destroyed a great vast area. Now these trees are protected, but they, they have the quality like a redwood. They have a kind of a tannin in them and they do not rot. So that's why the stumps are still there 60 or 70 years later. And you see them in the forest, the, the remnants that were burnt or were standing. Um, there is still a forestry industry more north than here because of uh, broader land and easier transportation. But down where we are, a lot of this uh, forest is now protected, though um, it is not what it used to be. Uh, there are some uh, trees that are still very big, virgin stands of Alaris, but uh, the Chilean authorities will not tell people where they are. They have trying to protect them from people coming up and. Uh, uh, rustling the logs or illegally felling them. And so now the, uh, the Chilean authorities have uh, made vast na uh, national parks and preserves. So there are still stands and of course over time they will grow, but um, th that particular tree grows very slowly. Others, uh, there's a lot of variety. There are dozens of uh, indigenous um, endemic uh, trees to this area that create a very complex uh, forest depending on where it is on the different islands. So there are many kind of junipers and uh, cypresses, um, kinds of cedars. Uh, one of the trees uh, is um, sort of like a eucalyptus, but a lot of it grows and then in the lower areas where they have the what's called the Val Valdivian rainforest. It, it grows moss and these kind of um, uh, boreal plants that, uh, bromeliads that live on the trunks and have a whole, uh, let's say, airborne jungle quality to it. But it's not hot jungle like you get over the mountains in the Amazon. This is cool, temperate forest. This is another uh, interesting tree, the Arayan, which is also called the Andean myrtle. Uh, it does not have any bark. It sort of looks like a eucalyptus tree. And if you get up close, you'll see that, that it has little bits of strips like eucalyptus, but uh, it actually is cold to the touch. For some reason, the, the tree protects itself by having a, a kind of a, a cooling mechanism on the tree. And then um, it grows in sort of a twisted bramble like this. Uh, it's a very good construction wood. They, they still harvest it for uh, framing of houses. That's the common tree for building around here. Here's another one, the Ulmo tree, which, which uh, flowers in a great white profusion. There we saw a few yesterday. 
I uh, didn't get close enough. But uh, the, here's another curiosity in the area where there was that um, <clears throat> the earthquake a few years ago blocked a river, flooded a part of the valley, and then killed off the forest, making a swamp. So even by natural forces, some of these forests are just fall victim to the natural problems of this very unstable area. Uh, another thing where you can see in the woods, we saw people picking this yesterday, was the uh, calafate, which is a little herb um, a bush with berries. And if you've heard this, if you, if you go out and pick them in, and eat those berries, which are sweet, then it said you will come back to Patagonia. Another thing we saw yesterday was the fuchsia, which is an endem uh, endemic kind of fuchsia, and it has these little uh, droplet-like uh, flowers. Uh, here's, I didn't quite focus well, but it opens up like a beautiful little earring. Others, we, we, this kind we saw also yesterday, the foxglove, which is a uh, beautiful standing uh, flower with uh, trumpet kind of uh, blooms. Then uh, we saw a lot of also the, the lupin, or the blue bonnets, which were spread all through the uh, fields there. And uh, um, we were surprised by uh, great fields of them up in the high valley. Those of us who are on that long ride over the mountain, this is a field of blue, and some of them are, are pink and yellow and white also. But they, they tend to take over the hill, and then they, they somehow keep out the rest of the plants. It's rare that a flower will keep a forest at bay. Another of the endemic species here is called the uh, kolukwe, which is a bamboo, a very primeval bamboo that doesn't uh, has segments uh, on a shaft, but it, it's not hollow. It's a hard stick, and then it grows in great fronds. Uh, then it, uh, it all goes to seed, and most of it dies in, uh, ever in a life cycle of about six years. So they spring up, and then they all seed, and then they all die. But there's always a few that don't die in case they have a fire or something, and there will be something to live through. But then the, uh, this is a very big bushy bamboo that um, is uh, similar to what you'll get in Asian forests. But it will then be this um, sort of a, uh, a great nest of... Um, the, this just yesterday, contrasted to the uh, the lupin, is quite a uh, special f feature of the higher parts of the fjords. Doesn't come down to the shore. But we also saw yesterday the most unusual of these trees, which is the Arucania arucana, or the monkey puzzle tree, or in the Mapuche name, it's called the Nahualbuta. And this is a probably the most ancient um, uh, floral remnant of uh, the Jurassic period. This tree is endemic to a little further north of uh, Puerto Montt, which is right here in the Lake District. Uh, here's Puerto Montt. It lived in an area that is uh, high and fairly dry compared to the fjordland, but now it is planted as an ornamental tree. Uh, it has this tremendous uh, rise and then a very pokey top like a bonnet. Um, and it, uh, it's a very hardy, hard wood and a very curious tree that uh, can live over a thousand years. They found some samples uh, but what they're done now is they're planted ornamentally because when they're uh, a, a, a sprout of a tree, they come out like this, which is a, looks like the, uh, the most fer fer uh, ferocious Christmas tree I've ever seen. And we saw them around the other day. If you went up and got a good look at them, they are something that you don't want to uh, have uh, <coughs> in your house because it just uh, it, this, this primordial plant form is just covered with spikes and I don't know where it got the name monkey tree, maybe a monkey puzzle, because maybe it was monkeys who could, who could play with this, but it's, so, it, 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 it's very off-putting. But it, um, it grows in a profusion of these spines, and then it also has um, a, a, fruit, a, a sort of a green flower that then turns into a, um, a cone. So it is sort of a pro prototypical um, pine or fir, but it's almost like a succulent, these big fleshy leaves that um, Certainly nobody wants to eat this unless it's a specialty for the local people, which it is. When they give this um, great cone, it a, a weighs a kilogram, and on the inside it's a very soft uh, kind of a cone. It's not a hard one. So they, the Mapuche people would, would harvest this and uh, have it as part of their diet. But they also thought this was a sacred tree, and they gave offerings to some of the very large samples of, of this uh, tree. Another of the native plants we saw yesterday is this great uh, garena, or it's called a uh, nalca in another uh, Mapuche name. And this is this tremendous sort of an elephant le uh, ear plant. Uh, it grows all over the hills and uh, in the forest, but uh, uh, here's a 
one of the natives, uh, to give an example of the size of it, thank you, Cheryl, who took the picture, but uh, it's also very spiky and very off-putting. If you looked at the leaves, it's full of uh, sharp uh, spines, and uh, then it again has a sort of a shoot and a, and a, a pod, seed pod, that again was a, a food for the native peoples originally. Now I'm going to go on to the, um, the, uh, the, the, the fauna here with the bird life, which is very extensive. Uh, maybe birds have it easiest around here because they don't have to swim around and there's, of course, there's very few big game walking around because a lot of this land is just so vertical and uh, the, the seas are big and the mountains are far. But the birds get around, so the, here's the uh, austral parrot or loro that sings uh, a kind of a thrush. The birders out there, you might have seen this one the other day in Puerto Montt, it was flying around on that overlook called the ibis, the buff-necked and has a black and white wings, it's about a meter uh, extent. Then you have uh, a lot of little birds, uh, Chucao, Tapaculo, they have ones called Fiu Fiu, Huet Huet, and a lot of native names that imitate the sounds of the birds, even if you don't see it, you can recognize it in the forest. Uh, here's the Magellanic uh, woodpecker, and uh, this looks like a real cartoon character to me. That is, of course, the bright male, and here is the uh, modest female. <coughs> and Here's a, a few seabirds. Here's a red-legged cormorant and a kingfisher that'll be fishing, of course, in the streams and on the seashore. Uh, here's a flicker. And then some southern lapwing, which are a pecking uh, field bird. Then the uh, torrent duck, which uh, f catches insects and things in the falling streams. There's also the steamer duck in the in the particularly in uh, Tierra del Fuego, I'll show you when we get down there. A lot of different varieties of them, but uh, here's an unusual one which is native to this Patagonian region, both on the Chilean and the Argentine side, the emu, or the rea. Uh, it's like the ostrich, and we saw one the other day uh, walking around there. Um, a kind of an aggressive bird and, of course, flightless, so, uh, but they didn't have that many predators here but until humans came and started hunting them for their feathers for fine hats. And so I was walking around and I found a few of the feathers, and uh, the, at least the ones that the llama didn't eat. And you can see each one has a single uh, point and then a double plume. And so this is why this bird was used as sort of the uh, uh, a dandy like flag uh, for um, uh, uh, the Yan those Yankee doodle, doodle dandies who used to put feathers in their hat. But anyway, this is a protected bird now. Then on the ocean, there are many of these um, fishing birds, uh, more the oyster catcher, which will actually break up uh, shellfish. Then there's a lot of swans. We'll see these, especially as we go south toward Tierra del Fuego, the, the black-headed swan, which is a very elegant bird. And then, um, of course, pelicans, more cormorants. There's a lot of colonies on the offshore islands. Uh, because the seas are very rich, there's a lot of fish flowing through the outer edges of as the, uh, uh, the Humboldt currents coming up the coast, there's a great deal of bird life living off of the great abundancy of the sea life. And so we'll see more of that as we go out and around. But up here in the high mountains, we have the top predator birds, which are, this is an Andean eagle, which has a wing spread of almost uh, two meters. But the biggest, of course, is the great condor. Uh, we may see some of those on our way into the Straits of Magellan, but they're usually very high in the very top of the cordilleras and on the edges of the ice field where they hunt for uh, very small game up there. But uh, they are now um, endangered because uh, people used to just shoot them because they could and they were pretty easy to shoot because they're so big. They have a, um, a four meter wingspan, which is quite fantastic. Now we saw this one that is an, a juvenile that was stuffed to uh, and not not so gigantic, but uh, you wouldn't want to be a mouse facing the likes of this fellow. So this is the, the largest condor in the world, and if you know the North American condor on the west coast of the U.S., uh, that has been so endangered that they had to have a captive breeding program to get the last of them uh, to survive, because when, even when the hunting stopped, they would be uh, poisoned by the accumulation of toxins from various... Uh, synthetic sources. So the same problem is happening in the Andean condor. But uh, the, you may have remembered the day before yesterday we got bothered by these. Now I, I, I did not do much uh, research into insects but I couldn't help but taking a picture of this one. We were swarmed around them. Um, they do took a little bite of me and a few people but uh, it's a big horsefly that's called a tabarone. 
but I, I heard the Chileans calling it a bicho, which is also a, a, a kind of an insult, but uh, the, those damn horse flies. But they're not as nasty as they look. Uh, but the, one of the locals told me that they get attracted to blue clothing. So that's a tip for you if you go back. We're, don't wear blue. Now I'll show you a few of the, the animals, the mammals. Now here's an otter um, that swims in the streams. There's some off, offshore here. And then the little mold, uh, monito de monte. These are a lot, there are lots of little uh, kind of shrews and voles that are on the food chain for especially the birds. Here's a kind of a skunk called the uh, chinque, which is uh, comparable to the North American skunk. And the gato montes, which is a wild cat that lives up in the higher elevations. And then uh, this is a particularly beautiful fox, the Darwin fox, also called the blue fox, which lives in the further s south than where we are. Most of these animals are very hard to see because they're living in a dense forest and they're not out in the open at all. But this fox is a very uh, crafty looking fellow. Um, it's, it's called a uh, zorro azul in, in Spanish. When, of course, uh, zorro is fox. There are the larger deer. This is the huemul, which is the Andean deer, um, which again is a forest dweller, does not come out into the f in, in fields very much, and is rarely sighted. But it, it grows to a midsize for a deer. Uh, in contrast, this is the smallest deer of all kinds you know, around the world, called the uh, pudu pudu. This only is 50 centimeters high, so it's a little tiny sort of a, a toy deer. And these are, are completely passive and not afraid. So if you find one in the forest, you can actually go up and pet it. For some reason, in spite of its size, it's not afraid of anything. Of course, that meant that it was captured for food and for pets and things, and it's, it's fur uh, very easily by the settlers. And again, now it's endangered and now raised mostly in, uh, in uh, local zoological parks. There are not many left in the wild because of their uh, uh, vulnerability. And then, of course, we see the llamas. Uh, this is a domesticated version that was raised in the higher Andean plateau and is um, been brought down mostly by the settlers again through the uh, ranches and such to be a source of wool. Um, it is not um, indigenous to these high mountains. The Huanuco is the local version of the, called the camelids, the, uh, the sort of the South American camels. But here's an example of the different furs and the different colors they get. And they have this curious look to them like they really don't like to see us because we might have clippers or something. And if you get too close, they'll either spit at you or, or nip at you. And years ago, I stayed at a, in a village in Peru next to a whole herd of them, and I had, to, I had to run in and out to get away from them because they'd see me coming. Maybe they didn't like the looks of me, but they, they would all spit at me as I went by. And I'm, I get used to that, uh, at home even. But uh, these, these llamas are, are, are charming from afar, but you get a herd of them, and they have a certain uh, f um, flavor to them that uh, they're, not, uh, they're better to look at than to smell. But there are herds of them. But the, the, the main one in this southern Patagonia is the guanaco. So, uh, these are yellow furred with a black head. They're different from the, the vicuñas that are north of here that are small and have the very finest of fur like the alpaca. Those are north in the central Andes rather than down here. But there's still herds of them around. This is the largest of the um, predator animals, though, the puma, the mountain lion, the cougar. And that's, this ranges from Alaska down to Patagonia, and is a very wily, solitary cat. It has a few pups um, in its season, and, but they, they, they don't live in a, in a pride, if that's the proper pride of pumas. Um, they go solitary hunting, and they are very stealthy and very quick to pounce with their paws and claws and then catch uh, their prey. So uh, they are not endangered just because they are too... Um, quick on their heels and uh, secretive, nocturnal. Again, they're a problem all over uh, places where livestock meets the wilderness. And that's true all the way up far North America. But this is a, a beautiful cat, but uh, I don't like the way he's looking at me. But uh, they don't usually attack humans. They're going after sheep and small game. There used to be much bigger crit crit critters here. Uh, here's the Glyptodon, which is a ancient giant Armadillo. Now, there are small armadillos still to this day, especially on the Argentine side in the Pampas. They burrow and they live on uh, underground and they come up and they feed it in the evenings and the early mornings, eat grubs and fruit, things like this. But they, they found fossil remains of some of these that are just truly tremendous. Uh, 
they, they are part of, let's say, the reduction of size of a lot of larger animals. Um, not, not even going back to the dinosaurs, but many of the ancient, uh, let's say, tigers and, of course, mastodons and all these things were much bigger than are the current population and addition of their uh, species. And so it is thought that the early humans in Patagonia hunted these and were able to get through their armor and chop them up. They found uh, archaeological sites with the remains of these glyptodons. And it's thought that it was actually the humans that led to the extinction of them in Patagonia. Another creature that has caused a lot of uh, interest, particularly uh, literary interest by Bruce Chatwin and other uh, people who imagine that the giant sloth or the milodon still exists. And they had found in a cave up near the ice fields a, um, the remains of a uh, giant sloth, but it was so, uh, the temperature was so dry and uh, so cold that the flesh and the hide and the bones were still intact. And so this led some of the early explorers to think there must be some more of these out there in the far deep woods. Now these things are five meters high, 15 foot high giant thing. Um, but they finally, later they tested these remains and they were, they were over 10,000 years old. So again, this went extinct and all we have are these great skeletons. And you can see the lady on uh, taking a look at it and, and uh, she thought she was married to a giant sloth, but no, this one's even bigger. And so you can imagine this thing 15 feet, 5 meters high, wandering around in these forests. And it had a, a thought to have this big tongue that could kind of grab fruit. And it, it, it was an herbivore. It was not a carnivore. So it was this big, slow, sleepy thing. Somehow I, I feel like that some mornings aboard the ship. But it no, it no longer exists. Uh, they, they have not found any real any evidence that it actually is still around. It's, it, it is perhaps by human hunting. Uh, but there are other larger creatures in the sea, especially the sea lions or the Lobo de Mar. We'll see them down south again in the, um, off the shores of Tierra del Fuego and, of course, in the Falklands. And we'll see a lot of seals. They, again, herd on these rocks on the outer shore. Those are the largest of the um, uh, pinniped family in South America. There are also a lot of dolphins. There are five species. We may see some of these, like the Peels dolphin, as we go out in the, in the channels out around toward uh, Punta Arenas. Uh, there are also whales that come into the fjords, particularly the blue whales come in to um, uh, mate and calve in the fjordlands, mostly to the north here, but we may see some. Um, this time of year they're, they're heading south to go feed in the great krill um, of the southern ocean off of Antarctica, but then they come back up here uh, to uh, mate. <clears throat> Here's some sightings off of one of the fjords. All those little red dots there are where they come to uh, frolic at those, a certain time of year. It's, it's actually in, in, in our northern summer. It's in July and August that they come up into this area, but they're still moving around. We may see something like this. This is, of course, the largest of all of the whales over, oh, it's about 30, 40 meters long in, in total. And if we sight one, we'll announce it from the bridge, they keep an eye out. By, by regulation now, all shipping must keep an eye out for whales and avoid them if possible. But uh, if we get a sight of it, we'll call, to, the bridge will call and tell people. Uh, but one of the uh, industries you saw uh, just yesterday was all the salmon farming. This is one of the changes in this area. There used to be a lot of wild salmon in the streams, and of course there's introduced trout, a lot of fly fishing. And, um, but the salmon industry in Chile has become quite extensive and has been the main reason why many northern Chileans have come down to those kind of ramshackle towns we see that are put up for people to go out and uh, help in these pens. They, uh, they fish for uh, small bait fish and also krill out in the ocean and then they come up and process that. Uh, just yesterday in uh, the port uh, Chacabuco, we could see giant bags of dried krill feed that they then out, go out into these ponds and then drop and feed at the different stages. They take the fry, raise them <clears throat> about a year, then they put them in another pond, and by in, within four to five years they are uh, fish this size. And we saw a truck going by yesterday with great piles of salmon. Now this has been a very difficult industry because even though they, they can feed the salmon, it usually takes three times as much other fish life to raise the same weight of a salmon. So we think that farm, fish farming is a good thing to do, but it's actually it's depleting other resources in the sea to raise the salmon. The other problem they have is the 
packing of the fish creates uh, um, sensitivities and viruses and other um, parasites on the fish, little lice and other things that get into their gills. And so now they have to feed antibiotics to the, in the feed to the salmon so they will continue to raise. But that's also created uh, some reaction just like raising chickens or cattle or, or other uh, food sources that the uh, putting all of this ingredients into the feed eventually ends up in the food itself. And one other problem is, is that if they, if they don't feed the salmon enough krill, which gives them their pink color, uh, they come out as a white f fish. And then they can't sell it. It looks, they say it's salmon, but it looks like another fish. And so therefore they have to put a, a dye in the feed to make sure they're the right color. And this has created a reaction among, uh, in the food industry. You say, well, this Chilean salmon is the most doctored and the most cardboard-like of farm fish. And, nothing compared to what wild salmon is, as you well know if you dine it. But nonetheless, the salmon industry has made it a, an affordable food source for much of the world now. And of course, it's now raised in many parts of the world, <clears throat> but uh, with some objections. But you can see these pens all the way through the fjords where we are. And they're fairly low-lying. This was the one off the ship uh, just yesterday. Uh, and as I said, when there's a bad weather or there's a landslide or something like this, these pens are fairly fragile and they break up and then the, the farmed f captive fish get out and then they mingle with what remnant wild salmon they are and they debase the wild stock. And this is just the way it is, but this is a big business in Chile. Uh, the other thing that's happening in the Fjordland is the construction of major hydroelectric dams. And this is to provide source for the grid for the booming cities in the north. Uh, and there's a plan to put hydroelectric um, dams on the Rio Baker and um, a number of other big rivers down in this area and then put high tension wires all the way up to Puerto Montt and then up to Santiago. Uh, this has created a considerable reaction in the local populace. And so just yesterday in Coyhaique, we saw this sign which says, and the represa is actually the barricades of the river. It's like the, the, the dam. And so there have been demonstrations in the south uh, and against this project because they say, you are ruining our rivers, you are silting up uh, valleys, uh, you're cutting down the forests for transmission lines, but we get no benefit. It's all for the north at the expense of the natural beauty of the south. This is a problem that goes around all over the world, but Chile has no oil and gas, so this is about their only great source of, of electricity. And um, in spite of protests down here, there's so few people in this part of the country that, of course, the, the larger population and the government have decided this is the future of the Fjordland. It's going to be a major hydroelectric generating area, not just for Chile, but it'll also go over to Argentina for that, again, now booming economy. And so this whole area has a you know, remarkable uh, geology, a, a very interesting wildlife, and then a, a, it feels like it's at the end of the world, but a very special place. And our guide yesterday had moved from Berlin to settle in Patagonia because he's an engineer and a uh, hiker and a, <clears throat> a nature-loving nature fellow. And so he committed himself to becoming a Patagonian. Um, and so a lot of people are very proud to be here, even though the humans have a pretty bad impact on this area, but nonetheless, that's the way of the world, especially here. And so I'm going to conclude by just uh, reading you again a, a, a poem of Pablo Neruda, which is called Aquí Vivimos, uh, This is Where We Live. And for the Spanish speakers, I recommend the Spanish version, but I will, I will try, try my best in my poor Amglish in this translation. But uh, Neruda talking about him moving to an island to settle in, it was north of here, but it's similar to the people that have come here. He says, I am one of those who live in the middle of the sea, close to the twilight, a little beyond those stones of the Andes. When I came and I saw what was happening, I decided on this spot to live. The day had spread itself and everything was light, and the sea was beating like a salty lion, many-handed. All that deserted space was singing, and I lost and awed, looking toward the silence, opened my mouth and said, Mother of the foam, expansive solitude, here I will begin my own rejoicing and my particular lament. And from then on I was never let down by a single wave. 
I always found the flavor of the sky in the water, in the earth, and the wood, and the sea burned together through the lonely winters. I am grateful to the earth for having waited for me. When sky and sea came together like two lips touching, for that's no small thing, to have lived through one solitude, to arrive at another, and feel many things, and recover and revive oneself. And so with that, I just wish you, uh, you uh, particularly a good private quiet moment in this most spectacular place because it is a